Thank you, Judy, for reading that a second week in a row. <laughs> I'm sure when you um, just heard that, you thought to yourself, that's not what I expected to hear. I heard that last week, and so did I. In many churches across the country, that was the lectionary uh, gospel reading for Easter Sunday. And so I listened uh, to many sermons last Sunday in churches that I've been a part of to hear how they were um, using that particular scripture. Now, I want to remind you that this is considered, the first Sunday after Easter is often considered a low Sunday. Do you know why it's called a low Sunday? Because the amount of people attending church the Sunday after Easter gets a little low. But it's my favorite Sunday. Over the years, uh, I served in many capacities in churches, but my favorite was being the associate pastor, who was always given the Sundays after the holidays. But I didn't consider them low. I considered them Sundays in which people had the opportunity to hear and to consider what they had heard before, or maybe didn't hear it quite so well. Last Sunday, in all the churches that we participate in, there's great music, more music than ever, that lifts our spirits. There's flowers and there's scents wafted through the sanctuaries, and we are in our finest dress, and we're glad to see families, and all that celebration takes place. But on the next Sunday, we have to act as Easter people, and that's what we are today. When I first heard this story many years ago, I was about 14 years old, I think, and it was on a Sunday night, it was Palm Sunday actually, and our youth group had gathered together, and we usually did a lot of fun things together, and of course the reason that all the boys came to this group of about 70 was because all the girls came to this group. <laughs> on that particular Sunday night, though, the pastor divided us up into groups and ask us to consider the Easter story, the resurrection story, from each one of the four Gospels. My group had this passage, and we read it out loud, and then we were to come back and give our um, initial reactions to that. Well, we all sort of argued as to who was going to speak for our group, and finally, one of the members of the group, one of my boyhood friends, said, well, I'll speak for our group. And when it came time to talk about what he learned in that resurrection story, he said to everybody else in the group, when we read that, that wasn't what I expected to hear. That the women went away afraid, and they said nothing to anyone. Now, if Hollywood was in charge of putting together that resurrection story, they would have rewritten it completely. I mean, here is a story where Jesus' resurrection appears for all the world to see. There's no lights or stars in the sky that say, I'm back. There's no Jesus going before Pontius Pilate and the Sanhedrin and the leaders of the Jewish religious community and say, you thought you had me, I'm back. <laughs> Who did Jesus appear to? In all the Gospels, Jesus appeared in very different ways to people who had some faith in what he had said and what he had done and whose mourning for his death was heavy on their hearts. Many of the stories that we read in the Bible are, you know, they're, they're, they're stories where the endings aren't what we expect. We've heard them so many times that we do expect that that's the ending. But when we really think about the endings to many of the Bible stories, that's probably not the way you and I would have written them. One of my favorite stories is about Joseph and his brothers. And you know that Joseph was sold into slavery because his brothers were jealous of him and his relationship to his father. They threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. 
And many years later, when they are in a famine and dying of hunger, they travel to Egypt. And they meet him by accident and do not recognize him. But he knows they are his brothers. And by the end of the story, just when you think that he is finally going to have his chance to get even, they have a reunion. And all is forgiven. Probably the most famous story in the Bible that everyone knows about and every guest preacher in any church talks about is the prodigal son. You know the story. A young man asks his father for his half of you know, his wealth, his inheritance. And he goes away and he spends it on who knows what. But he goes through it. He's lived the life that he wanted to live, but he goes through it, and pretty soon he's eating with the pigs. And he comes to his senses, the Bible tells us. And he's going to go to his father, and on his way back to see his father, to see if he can at least be given the opportunity to be one of his father's servants, he thinks, here's what I'll say to my father. I'll go to my father and I'll say that... I'm your son who has come back here because I need you. And you know, as he's coming back to his father's house, and along the way, his father goes and sees him at a distance and goes out and runs to him. If I was rewriting that story, I wouldn't do it that way. And maybe you wouldn't either. So here's how it would go. The son is coming home, and he's already figured out the speech he's going to give to his father so that he might get back into his father's good graces and so that he might at least have food and shelter and uh, maybe the chance of getting back into the family life. And as he approaches the home, he hears a lot of noise and singing and laughter. And as he comes to the gate of the home, one of his father's servants says, I think you might want to try the back door. And he says to the servant, what is going on here? And the servant says to the the one who went away, the prodigal son says, well, your father is hosting a wonderful dinner celebration because your brother saved the family business in a time of economic struggle and famine. Make more sense to you? Maybe you ought to go to the back door. Maybe you ought to lay a little low and not say much to your mother for a while. Don't let the neighbors get a chance to talk about where you might have been. It makes more sense. It's kind of what we would expect. It's kind of the way we live. So much of the Bible is like that. It's told in parables. And parables are riddles. They must have been welcome news for Jesus' hearers when they heard those parables, those stories about a woman looking for a lost coin or someone needing bread. Or perhaps that story when one of the disciples says, in terms of forgiveness, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven? And Jesus says, no, seven times, seven times. I don't know about you, I have a hard time with the first time. And there are all kinds of stories like that in the Bible. And so when we hear that, we can proclaim easily, that's not what I expected to hear. And especially when it comes to forgiveness. I once spoke to a woman who told me that she had been seeing a therapist. And I said, you know, were, were there reasons for that? And she said, well, I've been having a lot of pain, physical pain, arthritis. It doesn't run in my family, but I've had it. And in talking to my therapist, he suggested that probably if I would talk to my estranged daughter, who I haven't talked to in 15 years, that just maybe the arthritis 
would lessen. And I said, well, how do you feel about that? And she said, I told him I'd rather have the arthritis. <laughs> that wasn't what I expected to hear. <laughs> Several years ago, at Vanderbilt University, where I did a little bit of graduate work, a man named James Lawson, a United Methodist pastor, who had been a student at Vanderbilt in the early 1960s, was asked to come back to the school to receive an honor, and a chair was named for him at the Divinity School. James Lawson, in the early 60s, was a student at the Divinity School who helped organize and teach peaceful protesting. The sit-ins at the lunch counters in Nashville, the freedom riders who came on the buses south to integrate counters and facilities and try to move us to a better place. James Lawson was expelled from Vanderbilt University. He was expelled for not the sin of doing that training of young people in how to be nonviolent and for expressing his religious views about why that was important. No, he got under the skin of then President Harvey Branscombe because he had the audacity to play intramural football on the college grounds with white boys. And so Harvey expelled him. Harvey also saw to the firing of many of the faculty of the Divinity School from Vanderbilt, who then formed a new theological school in Ohio, where I attended and received my degree. So James Lawson was invited back, and it was a huge crowd that came, and a reporter from the Tennessean, the state newspaper, was there to see James get his honor. At the end, when the benediction was given and the organ was playing and people were still gathering around, a frail old gentleman walking unsteady with a cane came forward to James Lawson and he said, Jim, can you ever forgive me? And James said, I forgave you, Harvey, a long time ago. The reporter for the Nashville Tennessean, in her article about that event, said, I could not believe what I just heard. I didn't expect to hear that. For those of us that have ears to hear, as Jesus said, let us hear. Amen.